Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the opportunity given to us to present this work. As we all know, despite its robust effect to treat obesity, weight loss after bariatric surgery is highly variable. We know that when we place the duodenal jejunal bypass liner in obese patient, there, after one year of treatment, they lost, on average, 47% of their uh, excess weight loss. However, similarly to the effect of bariatric surgery, weight loss is also variable with this device. So the aim of this study was to identify clinical predictors of weight loss in this group of patients treated with this device for one year. We collected data from morbidly obese patients from 18 to 55 years old that were enrolled in our prospective non-randomized clinical trial. And we collect several variables, demographic, comorbidities, different biochemical parameters, and anthropometrics. And these variables were collected every four weeks after the device was endoscopically placed in this patient until one year of treatment. In order to look for predictors, we look for correlation between these baseline variables with weight loss after one year. And then we run univariate and multivariate analysis between these variables and the weight loss after one year of treatment. And here we have our population. We got 61 patients with an average age of 35 years old, mostly females, with an average BMI of 43. And importantly, out of these 61 patients, 21 of them had type 2 diabetes. In this graph, we see the weight loss progression curve. And as you can see, after one year of treatment, patients had lost an average of 46% of their excess body weight loss. And if we plot an histogram of this weight after one year of treatment, we can see that most of the patients do very well. They are in the, in, in the center part of this distribution, but we have few patients that do incredibly well, almost losing all of their excess body weight loss, but also we have few patients that lose less than we have expected. The univariate analysis indicated that three variables were associated with this weight loss after one year. We have OMA-ER, fasting glycemia, and hemoglobin A1C. All these three variables were inversely associated with the weight loss effect of this device after one year of treatment. But when we control for all these variables, only hemoglobin A1C was inversely and independently associated with the weight loss effect of this device. But importantly, if we compare the weight loss progression curves of patients with diabetes and without diabetes, we don't see that patients with diabetes uh, lose less weight compared to the group without diabetes. In conclusion, we can say that higher baseline hemoglobin A1C levels are associated with diminished body weight loss in morbidly obese patients treated with the GBL. In contrast to previous studies, type 2 diabetes did not affect the weight loss effect of this device. However, this result should be interpreted cautiously because baseline levels in this group of patients were on average 6.7 of hemoglobin A1C, which indicate a good glycemic control in this particular population. Therefore, patients with higher baseline levels of hemoglobin A1C could benefit from early intervention aimed to optimize the weight loss effect of this device. Together, this result showed that DGBL induces a significant weight loss in both patients with diabetes and without diabetes. Identification of clinical predictors of weight loss will help us to select patients that will benefit the most from particular intervention, and in this way, we can improve the outcomes and also the benefit and risk profile ratio of these procedures. Thank you very much. Um, could you restate your disclosure? Uh, sorry, so no, this, nothing to disclose. Okay. Any question? Uh, the paper is open for discussion. Uh, please come to the microphone. There's a microphone in each aisle and ask your question. Um, 
beside the uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, any other predictor of weight loss in this patient population? Certainly, uh, characteristics such as female, gender, or, uh, or age, does that came out? No, only, so in the univariate analysis, we only had the OMA-ER, fasting glycemia, right. and hemoglobin. Right, but um, what about the multi-risk uh, adjusted? Yeah, so only hemoglobin one. That was the only, that when we controlled for all the variables, that was the only one that showed up to be significantly associated. I have two questions. One would be, could you just tell us real quick about the sleeve itself, um, a little bit more about it, how long is it? Uh, and the second question would be um, the absolute differences in the hemoglobin A1C levels between the diabetics and the non-diabetics. Okay, so what was the third question, sir? Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the sleeve? Uh, okay, well, so, so this device, for people that is not familiarized with it, it is a highly flexible, nutrient impermeable uh, sleeve that it is placed uh, with an endoscopic procedure that takes on average 15 minutes, and it is 60 centimeters long, and basically it covers the entire duodenum and the first portion of the jejunum. And in this way, we're trying to mimic the bypass effect of the gastric bypass procedure. And regarding your second question, the average BMI on the group of patients with type 2 diabetes was 6.7, and in the group of patients without diabetes, it's around 6. This is the average. Question? Uh, Dimitri Stefanidis, Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I had a question in regards to, so one finding of your study is that hemoglobin A1C is a negative predictor, but the other finding you presented is that di type 2 diabetes doesn't matter. So I'm trying to understand how both of these can coexist. And the other question is, uh, what was the perioperative and during the study period risk profile of having this procedure. Sorry, can you repeat the second question, sorry? Oh, the risk profile of the procedure, the risk. The risk any, any of potential the... Risk. Ah, okay, 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 I see. Well, so if, uh, if, if we took into consideration only the hemoglobin A1C, we found that this variable explained about 10% of the total weight loss effect of this device, right? Um, and the other thing that we need to consider it is that because this group of patients were and had a good glycemic control, the difference between the mean in the, between the mean levels in patients with diabetes and without diabetes is very close. So from the clinical point of view, I mean independently of whether patients were diabetic or not, we saw that patients with the diagnosis of diabetes with higher uh, baseline levels of hemoglobin will, do, will lose less weight compared to the others. So you're saying that if you had a bigger sample size, you might have found a, a difference for the yes. heavier diabetic patients? Yes, now we have only, only like 60 patients in this study. Currently, probably we have about 100. So in the future, we are looking for, you know, repeat these studies to see what will show up. And in terms of the risk of the procedure, we have do uh, much better in this time. Uh, initially, you know, one of the biggest problems was not at the procedure itself Migration. was that some of the patients and in the study re uh, reported and published in Annals of Surgery, it has a rate of around 20% uh, early removal because of mainly migration, but with improvement in the device, we now are seeing that below 10%. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.